Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little background on Grantech. As you know, we're a system integrator and a solution provider with over 35 years experience. And we have regional offices across North America. And here you can see some of the typical services that we provide. On the plant floor, we provide services including packaging, controls and automation, industrial networking, MES integration, and the rest you can see here. As you can see, this includes most of the stuff you do within your building. Outside of that, one of the areas we help out with is coordinating with other plants and being able to drive corporate initiatives from your headquarters down to your plants and feeding that business intelligence back to them. We also do OEM coordination and supplier coordination. So when it comes to machine safety specifically, one of the values that we provide to our customers is that our heritage is not just in physical guarding. Our heritage is in improving productivity and driving operational excellence. So when we look at machine safety, we're looking at it through the lens of improving productivity. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Jeff Winter. Jeff is the director of Grantex Safety Practice, a division of the company that delivers safety-related services. His team is comprised of highly skilled safety experts that provide thought leadership to our clients. Besides earning his GUV CSB certification, Jeff is also very active within the safety community, especially as it relates to the development of safety standards. So before I hand this presentation over to Jeff, I wanted to go over some logistics. This presentation is 45 minutes, and please keep your questions to the end. Also, this presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you. Mm -hmm. I will also be muting everyone until the end of the presentation, at which point we will unmute everybody and you can ask all your questions. With all that being said, I'm going to hand this over to Jeff. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Thanks, Ash. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's presentation is meant to help everyone learn more about the topic of lockout, tagout, and alternative methods. In doing so, we will start with explaining the basics of lockout, tagout, and machine safeguarding. We'll touch on the regulations and industry standards that support these topics. Then we'll jump into the new Z244.1 standard, and we will review a few examples to help give some guidance as to how to move forward. And as I hope you already have picked up, I am in the United States, so please excuse my use of Zs instead of Zs. I will do my best to say them the right way. I usually pronounce the CSA standards with Zs and the ANSI's with Z out of habit, but I will try and make note of that through the presentation. Also keep in mind that this is meant to only be an introduction to the topic. You'll need to gauge the maturity of your organization to determine where you may need more education or guidance. So from my experience, this image sums up what I run into with most manufacturers. On one side, you have operations saying that lockout is hindering production and causing unnecessary downtime. And on the other side, you have EHS saying that lockout is the law of the land and the only way to keep people safe. Well, if both groups are pulling in opposite direction, this topic will forever be a tug of war. So hopefully with some education, especially after today, we can have some middle ground in bridging these two topics, resulting in increased productivity and safety. So before jumping into any of the details of lockout tagout, and especially alternative methods to lockout tagout, we need to ensure that we have a solid agreement and understanding of the fundamentals. Going over the difference between machine safeguarding and lockout tagout may seem trivial or even too basic, but it's essential to understand their differences before we can take advantage of how they can work together. So what is machine safeguarding? Well, machine safeguarding is a precautionary safety feature on equipment comprised of devices and methods designed to protect employees from hazards created by the equipment while working nearby or while operating equipment. Oversimplified? keep people away. So what are the requirements of machine safeguarding? Well, Canada is not set up the same way the United States is in terms of regulatory requirements. I will touch on both for the purposes of comparison and history, but they're actually structurally quite different. In the United States, OSHA was established in 1971 and set the minimum requirements for safety for the entire country. In terms of machine guarding, it hasn't changed since. That means that these regulations are 46 years old. 
In essence, they basically set the expectation that it's the employer's responsibility to provide a safe place of employment and protect employees from hazards created by machinery. It's vague and open to interpretation. In Canada, there is no real federal equivalent. The federal labor code only covers federal employees, transportation, and a few other sectors. For everyone else, the occupational safety aspects are handled at the provincial or territory level. The scope of occupational health and safety legislation varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and each province and territory publishes its own regulations in addition to the federal regulations. As such, all the 14 jurisdictions in Canada, one federal, 10 provincial, and three territory, have their own occupational health and safety legislation. A lot of these regulatory requirements are similar to the United States, as most of them were established many years after the development of OSHA in America. Because each of these provinces is regulated differently, they all have a different set of requirements. And I'm not gonna go over all the differences, but in general, the overarching sentiment in terms of machine safeguarding reflects the American equivalent and the American requirement, which is that it's the employer's responsibility to protect workers from hazards created by machinery. So let's look at Ontario as just one quick example. The province of Ontario may be the, have the most complete set of machine guarding requirements in Canada. Regulations are made by the Ministry of Labor under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Regulation 851, which became the law in 1990. This established responsibilities, including providing appropriate information, instruction and supervision to protect workers, ensuring that equipment provided is maintained in good condition, and determining if the need for a pre-start health and safety review must be conducted on newly installed machinery. As you can see here by this one example requirement, which happens to be the first requirement of the regulation, essentially all hazards created by machinery must be guarded. This concept, although worded differently, is the same in all provinces and territories and essentially matches the requirements of OSHA in the United States. Once again, at a high level, OSHA in the United States is stricter, lengthier, and more prescriptive as it was established much earlier. However, two main differences that you might want to consider between the United States and Canada in terms of the regulatory requirements is the emphasis of personal responsibility. That includes both the supervisors as well as the employees. Nowhere in America regulations are there any legal ramifications for supervisors or direct responsibilities for the employees themselves. OSHA in the United States is only written for the employer, the company. And that changes incentives a little bit when you cross borders. So now let's look at lockout tagout. So what is lockout tagout? Well, lockout tagout refers to specific practices and procedures to safeguard employees from the unexpected energization or startup of machinery and equipment or the release of hazardous energy during service and maintenance activities. Oversimplified, remove hazardous energy. Most injuries that occur on machinery actually occur from servicing and maintenance tasks related to the use of, like I said, service and maintenance and not normal production operation. This would make sense because the times where you're servicing and maintaining equipment are where you're most in harm's way. In practice, lockout is the isolation of energy from the system. It could be a machine, the equipment, the process, which physically locks the system in a safe mode, uh, removing all that hazardous energy. There's an energy isolating device which is manually operated. It could be a disconnect switch, a circuit breaker, a line valve, or a block that, like I said, it removes hazardous energy from the equipment. One thing to really note is a cultural difference between the United States and Canada is even the term lockout tagout is different. That's actually an American term. The term represents the procedure for controlling hazardous energy. However, everywhere else in the world, and especially Europe, but also Canada, this concept more typically refers to hazardous energy control. Of course, one of the methods is locking out or tagging out or alternative methods. Now, the term lockout and tagout themselves aren't the same. Actually, one thing that's uh, drastically different is the term tagout of the two. In the United States, tagout is identical to lockout in what it accomplishes. It's just that the device itself attached to the energy isolating device is different. Under certain circumstances in the United States, we can permit the use of tags without a lock to secure energy isolation. This is not permitted in Canada under any circumstance, and therefore the term tagout isn't actually recognized in Canada the exact same way it's recognized in the United States. 
In Canada, the term is still used, but often it's meant to mean the addition of a tag to the locking device, which is a mandatory, uh, mandatory part of the procedure. That being said, the term lockout tagout is still widely used as common vernacular actually everywhere in the world, but it more refers to the hazardous energy control program in Canada. And so I'm gonna keep using that phrase throughout this presentation, but it's one thing to know. So what are the requirements for lockout tagout? Well, similar to machine guarding, the requirements in Canada are not nearly as cut, as dry, cut and dry as they are in the United States. All Canadian jurisdictions do address lockout in some form in their occupational health and safety regulations. However, this is typically done as part of their general sections on machinery and equipment and rarely is a dedicated section. That's much different than the United States. On this slide here, I have included just a few snapshots to show requirements uh, for British Columbia, Quebec, and Ontario, the three provinces where Grand Tech has offices. All three are different, as you can see. In the case of Ontario, the requirements for lockout tagout are actually scattered throughout Regulation 851. Some are in machine guarding, and some actually fall under the maintenance and repairing section. As a bit of history, the OSHA regulation in the United States was developed in 1989. 18 years after the regulation for machine guarding. It's an entirely different section of the OSHA Act, and that was based off of the development of the 1982 version of the Z244.1 standard as the principal reference source. Basically, the industry in America set the best practices, and then years later, OSHA in the United States basically followed suit and set it as practice uh, for a, the requirement in the United States. And then what happened after that is a lot of the Canadian provinces followed the OSHA requirement, which once again was based off of the ANSI Z244.1 standard. The regulation in America is OSHA 1910-147, which is about 13 pages if you print it out. In America, it's funny because we happen to think that's extremely short. However, 1910-147 is by far the most complete regulation in all of North America in terms of topics covering and pertaining to lockout. Regulations in Quebec and Ontario and the federal regulation in Canada do not cover two thirds of these themes. The remaining Canadian provinces and half of them don't even cover, or sorry, they don't even cover half the themes in there. So it can be argued that the provincial regulations in Canada lack many of the themes of lockout, especially as they're described in the OSHA requirement in America. Quebec, though, interesting enough, actually calls out specific activities that are part of their lockout regulation. That's one thing that's actually unique compared to all the other regulatory requirements throughout Canada. So where does lockout, tagout, machine safeguarding intersect? Well, the lines can be a little bit blurry, and defining these lines is actually why I personally spend most of my time educating others. If you have a particular machine you're looking at making safe, you'll need to apply both lockout, tagout, and machine safeguarding. They serve very different purposes, and that's why they tend to have different regulatory requirements, even if they do happen to be jumbled together. They're both essential to providing a safe machine. So, lockout tagout applies only to service and maintenance tasks, where the default go-to requirement is to lock out the machine by removing hazardous energy. Machine safeguarding applies to the general use in normal production operations. Think about everything that's not servicing and maintenance tasks. Just make sure that any old employee or bystander doesn't get hurt by the equipment. A good visual to think of it is childproofing the machine where the go-to requirement here is just to keep people away from the hazards through physical guarding or by adding safeguarding devices that either detect people entering an area they shouldn't be entering or detecting them inside an area that they shouldn't be inside. In both cases, these devices must ensure that the machine enters a safe state. Now that safe state doesn't necessarily mean removing power like the requirements of your lockout tagout program. And that's where part of the confusion can come in. So as hopefully you may be able to figure out, the main distinction between the two is based off the particular task at hand. Defining, or sorry, depending on what the employee is doing determines what type of protection should be used. Think of it like this. If an employee needs to do something to or with the machine, then the default is to lock it out. If a curious employee walks up to the machine and says, ooh, what's that? And then they go try and touch it and they can get hurt, that's where you need to do machine guarding. 
So there's a lot of obvious tasks where lockout tagout makes sense, such as replacing a motor. But then there are a lot of other tasks where it doesn't necessarily or easily fit into the requirements of one or the other. That is where we enter this elusive space called the minor servicing exception. Now this term, minor servicing exception, is just an industry way of describing a small note in the American OSHA regulation 1910-147-A2IIB specifically. This one little note, which I'm going to read you, is what gives employers the ability not to apply the requirements of lockout tagout in the United States. It's extremely powerful, even though it's so short, and it's one sentence. And I'm going to explain why it matters to all the provinces and territories of Canada as well. So reading it, it says, minor tool changes and adjustments and other minor servicing activities which take place during normal production operations are not covered by the standard if they are routine, repetitive, and integral to the use of the equipment for production, provided that the work is performed using alternative measures which provide effective protection. So the reason why this note is useful, even in Canada, is because this concept of minor servicing exceptions were developed by the ANSI Z244.1 committee many years ago, which then were used to develop the OSHA regulation in America, and then were adopted in concept by the CSA Z460 standard in 2005. So keep in mind, the term minor servicing exception doesn't actually exist in any Canadian regulation. It doesn't exist in CSA Z460. It doesn't even exist in the ANSI Z244.1 standard. It's just a concept that allows the use of alternative methods in lieu of lockout. And the name just kind of stuck. So it's used everywhere, even though the concept is only applied specifically by name in America under 1910-147. So we thought it's important for you to know that. The reason why I showed you is because personally I believe the 1910-147 exception, what I show you right here, is the most concise way of explaining times where you don't need to lock out. But the devil's in the details. Defining what each of those underlying items mean is really important and can make or break your ability to claim this exception. Essentially, this exception allows employers the ability to use their general machine guarding, assuming it's adequate, of course, as an alternative to lockout tagout for a special set of tasks. Now, according to regulatory requirement expectations already, your machine safeguarding should already be adequate to protect employers for normal conditions. But what about when you use your safeguarding for what we're calling this minor servicing exception? Can you claim that your safeguarding provides effective protection during service and maintenance activities? That's something to consider as we continue on. So now let's talk about the industry consensus standards. I've been mentioning standards like CSA Z460 and the ANSI Z244.1. But what are they and how do they fit in? Industry consensus standards such as CSA, ANSI, ISO, NFPA are independent groups which organize and develop a consensus of what the industry best practices are on a particular topic. Anyone is welcome to participate in the development. So in Canada, CSA is the largest and most widely accepted standard development organization, which also happens to be accredited by the American equivalent of ANSI. So in Canada, there are a couple major standards which address machine safeguarding and control of hazardous energy. That can be good because basically everything is consolidated to a small number of places, but it can also be bad because it means that they're more vague than some of the other equivalents in America or in Europe. In comparison to the five major CSA standards, there's roughly 30 American equivalent and literally hundreds of ISO and IEC international standard equivalents. CSA does a great job of referencing the, the international best practices, both in America and Europe, as part of their development. This typically means that the standards are very thorough, but they're not leading in the marketplace. They rely on the development of the other ones overseas. So, some of you may be thinking, oh my, that's obnoxious, that sounds like a lot of standards, a lot of waste of time, know all of them. But another way to look at it is, the wheel to your problem has already been invented by others. It's just a matter of searching for it and finding it. So, you only need to find a handful of standards that apply to you, and trust me, they will help you answer questions so you don't have to spend time trying to figure them out yourselves. They save you time. So now, that we know that standards are developed and they're voluntary in the industry, are they required? 
Well, in America, the simple answer is no. However, they're used by both sides, the employer and the government, OSHA, to prove that things are either safe or unsafe. So they're very heavily used. In Canada, however, it's a little bit more complicated. Some of the voluntary stand, uh, standards have been referenced in legislation, but of course, none of them have been adopted by all regulations across the country. For example, in British Columbia, in Manitoba, Newfoundland, Labrador, and Yukon, the application design, construction, installation, and maintenance of guards must comply specifically with CSA Z432, the 2004 edition, safeguarding of machinery. The Northwest Territories, Nunavut, uh, require guards to comply with whatever the current version of the CSA standard is, not necessarily any particular one. And current ANSI standards and others are also accepted by the territory's chief safety officer. So you can follow ANSI standards to demonstrate compliance in some cases. British Columbia also states that guards and certain machine types, such as woodworking machinery and punch presses, they actually have to comply with a different set of very specific standards for those machines. So it's not as clear cut as you can see by all these question marks here as to what you necessarily can, should, and are required to follow everywhere. So in general, applicable to our topic at hand, I found it easier to break the available standards into following categories. And I'm not just talking about CSA standards, I'm talking about all standards out there in the marketplace. So this is just a way of grouping the standards in a manner that I think help make sense. Like I said, this includes all standards out there. So there are assessment standards, which help make sure that you identify and remediate hazards appropriately. There are product standards, which help give you confidence that safety devices and technology are fail-safe and designed correctly. There are application standards, which ensure that safety devices and technology are applied, installed, and used properly. There are performance standards, which ensure that all safety systems, which is essentially all your devices connected together, that they're designed to still work in the event of a failure. And there's validation standards, which make sure all the pieces were put together properly to ultimately reduce the risk. So in addition to these standards, there are also a few other standards like CSA Z460 in Canada and ANSI Z244.1, which tackle a very specific topic and pull from all these standard types to help support it. It's kind of viewed as a simpler way of collecting all the information together in one spot using these well-established standards on the market. So, in the case of lockout tagout, there's only one Canadian industry consensus standard, that is CSA Z460, and one American industry consensus standard, ANSI ASSC Z244.1. So now let's talk about ANSI Z244.1 because that is one of the big deals and what has changed recently and the main topic of today's discussion. So since 1973, the Z244 Accredited Standards Committee has been developing and revising the standard on control of hazardous energy. The first publication was in 1982 and reaffirmed in 1992. 2003 was the last major revision to the standard, which was then reconfirmed again in 2008 and 2014. Grand Tech joined the Accredited Standards Committee in 2014 and was a participant in the development of the new 2016 revision, which just got released this past December. So with the increased use of risk assessments and advancing technologies, there are now conflicting, uh, conflicting views on the requirements for how and when to control hazardous energy, oftentimes causing employers to take the stricter route of locking out all the time. There is no disagreement on the basic principle that workers should be protected by unexpected startup uh, and release of hazardous, hazardous energy. However, there continues to be disagreement on when, how, and which requirements apply. So the committee for the 2016 revision basically concentrated on how to control hazardous energy using methods based off current knowledge. The committee's discussion changed from the focus to how to meet OSHA in the United States instead to what is the right thing to do given current technology and industry best practices to protect workers. That's a big change and really it's important to know, especially for the rest of the world. So the introduction of CSA Z460 in 2005 was the first introduction of guidance to lockout tagout at a national level in Canada. 
the task for which lockout has has to be applied vary between the standards, but essentially both standards include repairs, maintenance, and servicing. However, tasks such as uh, startup and a few other ones are different in what they actually tackle. So it can be observed that the CSA Z460 and Z, uh, the Z244.1 standard address all the same main themes in relation to lockout. This is not surprising since the CSA Z460 is based in part off the 2003 version of Z244.1, which once again was based off of the OSHA 1910-147. Therefore, the changes in this new Z244.1 standard will be heavily influenced on the next revision of the CSA Z460 standard. And that's why it's really important to know. So, the 2016 revision presents distinct requirements for controlling hazardous energy through three different approaches. Lockout, which has always been and still will be the primary approach. Tagout and alternative methods. Now, none of these categories of solutions are new, but they have been revised. Alternative Methods has received a bunch of additional attention to emphasize their importance in the energy control process, which heavily rely on the need for risk assessments. Since the standard is designed to control hazardous energy in the best possible ways to protect employees, the approach to solely catering towards the American OSHA was rejected, like I said before. This means that the artificially created concepts of normal production operation and service and maintenance, they've been removed. And by removing ourselves from the shackles of these arbitrary terms, the committee was able to develop an entirely new set of guidelines for when lockout is required and alternative might be used. The standard is now way more task driven than before. This is in contrast to the previous reliance on the type of activity being performed. Before, and according to the regulatory requirements, if it was a service and maintenance activity, it didn't matter what the task was. Lock it out. And then we're going to give you this little exception that's going to be hard to claim. But now, the standard helps provide much more ammunition to explain how each and every task is safe regardless of the activity it falls into. So this change in not catering to OSHA in the United States means that this standard hopefully will be more universally accepted and applied, not just by employers, but also machine builders and integrators. This also means being more widely accepted in other countries like Canada. Let's go over what's actually covered in the standard. Listed here are all the sections of the standard. The last revision only had a total of five sections. This one has eight. That itself shows how drastic this revision expanded. The standard went from 72 pages to 128 pages. The main meat of, this, of the standard is in sections 4 through 8. What I'm going to go over is not all the requirements, but just some of the notable changes and takeaways. Going over the standard in its entirety would take much more than a lot of time. And just as a point of comparison, the CSA Z460 is only about 43 pages of requirements. So you can see that there is a big difference in the amount of information that is included in these standards. So it's still worth considering this even if you follow the CSA Z460 standard. So the new Z244.1 basically goes into a lot more explanation as to how you can approach a lot of the same topics that are covered in both standards. So the first three sections were fairly boilerplate, so we're going to jump right into section four, responsibilities. In general, the responsibility requirements are the same. However, the 2016 revision expands the requirements for what they call supplier, which are machine builders, integrators, contractors, and even your in-house engineering teams. Suppliers that follow the standard are now required to meet all the design requirements established in section five, which we'll go over next. That's a brand new requirement and emphasis. In addition, the user now has much more clearly specified requirements around procuring safe equipment and ensuring that all equipment is compliant with the standard. It actually now requires employers to develop a plan for addressing all your existing equipment, not just new equipment. The reason that that's there is because you should already have an energy control program, even if it's very basic and just says lock out all the time. So, that being the case, as an employer, it may be worth considering the requirement that all of your suppliers, which is a reminder, machine builders, integrators, contractors, follow this standard as a part of corporate safety specification. This single requirement can ensure that your new equipment that you're getting or your capital upgrade projects when completed will fit nicely into your existing energy control program. 
This is especially beneficial if you're buying equipment overseas, where lockout tagout is viewed much differently, and I guarantee you probably won't get what you expect. So requiring the standard helps solve that problem. As an example, if you hired Grantech to upgrade or modify a machine, even if it has nothing to do with safety, and you require that we meet the standard as part of the upgrade, we would be compelled to give you the documentation necessary to ensure that all of our modifications are not only safe, but that we give you the information so that we can tell you how these modifications fit into your lockout tagout program. Without it, it's up to you as the employer you would be tasked with having to figure it out on your own. So then the question is, would having this information given by your supplier, in this case, Grantech in this example, would that be useful to your organization? So the biggest section will, which will affect suppliers is section five, the design requirements. This is where the engineer lives. So remember, in the last version of the standard, this specific section was not really called out is the responsibility of the supplier. There's a lot of good stuff in this section based off industry best practices. The single biggest change here is the requirement of a risk assessment before and during the design phase. Even though this should already be a best practice today, Z244.1 now mandates it. So suppliers meeting the standard are now compelled to not only evaluate the risks, but document them and provide the justification for how and when to use alternative methods. This requirement may add a tiny amount of cost to a project up front, but I guarantee it will save you a tremendous amount of money and time at the back end. By requesting this, you essentially hold the supplier, the experts on the equipment, accountable for giving you the information you need to justify your alternative methods to lockout tagout. You aren't obligated to follow the procedures provided by, a supplier, by the suppliers, but at least you'll have the information you need to be armed and equipped. Related is some new additional requirements around uh, documentation, as you can see listed here. As you can tell, this really emphasizes making sure that the suppliers adequately document decisions and give proper instructions. That's a big change. There's also additions to the use of warning labels, placards, or special instructions that are located in the area of the hazards to provide information to employees working on the equipment. Control integration has been revised to state that the integrity of the control system now needs to be commensurate with the level of risk. Before it was very vague. This actually now matches suit with all assessment standards currently on the market. And lastly, there's a requirement to evaluate and consider tamper resistance to reduce the motive to defeat the hazardous control method. That's brand new. So knowing all these changes, it may be worth considering how your company currently specifies safety to suppliers or even going further one step and basically asking suppliers, how are you designing systems for control, control of hazardous energy? Even if they don't follow the standard, do you even know what they're doing? So section six addresses the development of a hazardous energy control program. This applies only to the employer. So in both uh, America and Canada, the regulatory requirements state that the employer must develop an energy control program but the requirements are only summed up in just a few sentences. So it's very difficult to understand how you actually develop that. So Z244.1 gives guidance on how to develop a program, which in turn helps you meet your regulatory requirements. This section is solely dedicated to setting up and managing your program, including program elements, communication training, program reviews, methodologies for selecting your control methods. So new in the 2016 version is the subsection addressing management of change. Lastly, another change is the suggested decision-making process, process for the selection of lockout, tagout, or alternative methods. This is a big deviation from the old standard and actually puts a lot of weight on making sure that lockout is still the preferred method and pushes back heavily on the risk assessment to determine the use of alternative methods. So something to consider is how mature your current lockout, tagout program is. Does it even include an option for alternative methods? Is your program more than five years old? If so, it may be worth reevaluating. So section seven, which was formerly subsection five of the old standard, is now a dedicated section explaining how to actually control hazardous energy at the machine level. This includes setting up requirements around procedures, hardware, energy isolating devices, your group lockout, complex lockout, and a few other areas. In general, this section is the most similar to the old standard, 
but there are some notable changes including adding elements to what should be included in your actual lockout procedures themselves and increasing emphasis on verification of de-energization through testing. It also expands procedures for user-directed lockout tagout device removal. So one thing to consider here is to actually look at your lockout procedures themselves. Do they include all the right elements, especially around your verification of de-energization? It might be worth comparing. So now let's talk about Section 8, Alternative Methods. A lot of people want to jump right to this information, and that's all they care about. They want to know, how do I avoid locking out? That mindset is really not the best and can get you into more trouble than good. Cherry picking certain sections misses the holistic approach and ultimately results in a less safe machine and being in a very difficult spot when attempting to explain how you developed a good lockout program when you only followed one of the sections. So in order to entertain using alternative methods, you need to follow the entire standard, which establishes the basis for a robust program, where alternative methods is one of several options for controlling hazardous energy. A good program includes it. It doesn't jump right to it as the silver bullet. So in the old standard, there was only a couple of paragraphs addressing alternative methods, but now there's an entire section dedicated to it. At the very beginning, it states the requirements that must be met before an alternative method is to be used. And they include a justification analysis to make sure the task is the right task. They talk about the risk assessment to evaluate the risks with a, with a systematic method to reduce them, an evaluation of the hierarchy controls, and even an evaluation of the alternative method itself. You can't just go pick any method you want, like let's say a light curtain and say, yep, that works for me, like you can with general machine guarding. You have to be able to ensure that that was the right method. So the evaluation of selected alternative methods is eight pages long in itself. There's a lot to consider and questions you want to be prepared to answer in this section. So you're aware there's also a requirement that alternative methods be designed by qualified individuals. Now, of course, they leave that open to interpretation for you to define what qualified is. So something you might want to consider is seeing if your suppliers or your designers, whether they're internal or external, are qualified. The most common industry certification for machine safety design is a TUV certification, which has a couple of different flavors. In the case of Grand Tech, we currently have four people with TUV certifications. It's not easy to earn, but it does help explain how we're qualified to do safe design. So, as a reminder, the requirement, the default, is to lock out, tag out for service and maintenance related activities. That's just a general sentiment across both Canada and the United States. And the Z244.1 committee echoes that similar sentiment. But let's review some times where lockout may not be the best method. These are some examples where alternatives may qualify. Let's say you have hazardous energy that must be present uh, because it's required to perform a task. There are times where you need power or you can't complete that task. Another be, may be where lockout is not feasible or practicable. Now, feasible is an easy one to answer. It just can't be done. Here's why. But practicability is more open to judgment and would require a more thorough explanation. Another may be where a documented risk assessment shows that the task can be performed with acceptable risk. This basically allows you to say, I don't need to lock out because there isn't a way I can get hurt. This is especially valuable if you install safeguards that control or eliminate the hazards. Another is when the inherent hazards, such as thermal or radiation, are unable to be controlled using lockout or tagout. Sometimes it just doesn't remove the hazardous energy. Think of heat. Or another is when energy is required to maintain equipment in a safe state. There are times where electricity is needed to hold a machine in a safe position, and removing power would actually make it more unsafe. And lastly, think about uh, repetitive cycling of energy isolating devices where they can compromise the safety function. Basically, you can show that repetitive lockouts actually deteriorating your safety system. These are just a few examples, but how do you claim these or demonstrate these? This is where the risk assessment comes into play. All these would be documented any industry best practice risk assessment process, and they're used to help support your justification for why you shouldn't or can't be locking out. So in my opinion, one of the most overlooked aspects of the standard is the annexes. 
Annexes are technically not part of the standard, meaning they aren't part of the requirements. They just support the requirements through examples to give you guidance. Essentially, the committee wanted to provide a bunch of way of helping you meet the standard. There are 78 pages in the annexes, which is unprecedented. The old version had 41 pages, and that's in general about 50% more than most standards on the market. So I wouldn't dismiss them. As a few examples, they include sample risk assessments, lockout inspection forms, management of change forms, sample justification forms, and even three different lockout tagout procedures themselves. They also even include examples of how to do alternative methods on real machines with real pictures of the solutions. One of the areas that I personally helped contribute the most to the standard was on the alternative methods justification template, which is on the top right here. So we wanted to help give all the readers a simple and concise way of listing the methods that you're able to explain why you're using alternative methods. So it may be worth considering evaluating your current templates and documents to see how they compare. And this is something even if you follow the CSA Z460 standard, you may want to look at some of these to see if these examples are a good way of meeting that standard also. So we just went through some of the highlights of the Z244.1 standard and the impacts it can have on your organization. And hopefully you can see that if properly applied, you can help drive a safer and a safer environment and a more efficient lockout program, which in turn will lead to uh, lower incident rates and more productivity. You can minimize lockout to the only the times where it's needed and have confidence that your alternative methods are still providing effective protection. So depending on the maturity of your organization's safety, engineering, and operations department, this may be easy or diff difficult to implement. This depends on how your company currently handles lockout, tagout, and machine guarding. However, you could argue that the further you are behind, the more you have to gain. So what I'll talk about here is some of the main areas you want to consider if you're planning on implementing the Z244.1 standard. So first is your lockout, tagout program itself. So as you know, you need to have a program. It's just whether it's the bare bones or whether it's um, set up to accept the ability to use alternative methods. So as part of that, you'll need to ensure that you do task-based risk assessments and justify your use of alternative methods. As part of that process, you'll need to determine your company's risk scoring criteria and what your company determines is an acceptable level of risk. Another area would be to uh, look at your machine safeguarding program, which is typically separate from your lockout, tagout program. Now, there is no requirement in Canada or in the United States to have a, a dedicated machine guarding program, but as soon as you start to rely on your safeguarding as alternative methods to lockout, tagout, you really need to have a program in place to ensure that your safeguards are adequate and stay effective over time. So now this includes the need for risk assessments, which you might as well make it task-based so that you can kill two birds with one stone. You also need to establish requirements around inspection and testing of safeguards. They can't just be installed and never evaluated again. And also talk about and include your training and awareness. This is critical. What are the hazards? What are the safeguarding measures in place? And how are these measures protecting operators? Next is safety specifications, which typically fall under your engineering specifications. This is what tells the suppliers and your internal engineers and even your maintenance how all safeguards should look and feel. You need to specify a set of standards to make sure that you're getting exactly what you expect. This includes your acceptable methods of safeguarding, the documentation you expect to have. Not just, hey, conduct a risk assessment, but give me a copy of the risk assessment. It includes design and functional aspects. As an example for that, a design requirement would be make sure your e-stop is a red button with a yellow background. A functional requirement would be an example of, well, what to do when you push it? This may seem basic, but if you don't specify it, I guarantee your e-stops will all be different. And lastly is verification and validation requirements. These are two separate steps that ensure that safeguarding methods were designed and installed correctly. Ask for proof as part of your records. Last uh, major area to consider is your, uh, your project management process. This is very much tied to your safety specifications, but more addresses the process for how you actually meet your safety specifications. This includes setting up uh, stage gates and approvals and uh, managing your deviations and your exceptions. So without a fully developed program, your only choice for interaction really is lockout. That's, that's it. 
So I'm going to show you kind of one example of what a lockout tagout program can look like when it includes alternative methods. So in this example, there are four possible solutions. Lockout tagout, um, the use of secondary protective measures, reliance on your existing safeguards, or the use of a permit. So as you can see here, maintenance, cleaning, or scheduled servicing tasks still require lockout tagout as the default. However, there's options now for others. So in this case, any unscheduled or unplanned activities that may happen frequently have different choices depending on what you have in place. As you can see here, no guards or fixed guards still require lockout. But depending on the reliability of your safety system and the safeguarding measures you have in place, which you can see determined here by what's called performance levels, A, B, C, D, or E, which is essentially a reliability of your safety system, you can start to rely on those alternative methods. And then we still have, in this case, live work tasks which require permit. So now, this overall program example may not work for you, but it's one example how you can make a program to include alternative methods. So now with that we've covered program, let's dive into the machine level and look at how to approach this. To do this, I'm gonna bring up a few examples of various Grand Tech projects to help illustrate the process. But keep in mind, I'm pulling from a variety of different projects to show as much variation as possible. You'll be able to see how Grand Tech has helped clients make equipment safe and compliant to Z244.1 and fitting well into your energy control program. By no means are these the only ways you can do it, but they are examples that you can, you can pick from. So let's start with any machine. I have a few examples here. It can be anything from simple mixers, machine tools, to more complicated production lines. Now, the more complicated the line, the more the Z244.1 process pays off. Or you can say the more your lockout's hindering production, the more the process pays off. So the very first step when addressing any machine is to conduct a risk assessment. This applies to machines already existing on your floor or newly purchased machines. Risk assessments are starting to become best practice in the industry. However, not everyone performs them. In fact, most machine builders don't unless you specifically request it. Those who do perform it typically perform hazard-based risk assessments and not task-based risk assessments. Why is that? Well, if you're only addressing the guarding of hazards, then evaluating the tasks may be unnecessary, and therefore you just look at the hazards. This results in a shorter risk assessment process and shorter risk assessment report like you see here on the left. However, to use your safeguarding as alternative methods to lock out, tag out, you need to evaluate every task, or at least the task you want to use for alternative methods. The left is a less expensive hazard-based risk assessment that only addresses machine safeguarding. The one on the right is a task-based risk assessment which addresses both machine safeguarding and lockout tagout. They both provide value, but for different purposes. So if you, have, if you only evaluate hazards, it's hard to tell how the safeguards protect against certain tasks. This essentially limits you really to lockout tagout for everything. <clears throat> a machine that only has, let's say, six hazards may have 40 tasks, and the risk may be entirely different for all those tasks because the tasks are different. So with a task-based risk assessment, you can really see how dangerous each particular task is and come up with individual solutions, of which some of them will be lockout and others will rely on your safeguarding. Some may not even require any action at all because there isn't really any hazard for that task. So after evaluating your risk for each individual task, the next step is to develop a risk reduction plan. This is basically an overview of what needs to be done, modified, changed, or installed in order to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. In this particular example, we came up with four different risk reduction measures for the machine and grouped them together by the hazards. We then also reevaluate the risk, assuming these measures are in place, and make sure that that residual risk ends up that, at a level that everyone's comfortable with. Something to consider is when you're talking or talking about and tackling both machine safeguarding and lockout tagout at the same time, it may be worth ensuring that all risk reduction measures are included, even the ones that currently exist on your equipment. This doesn't apply to new machinery, but on most risk assessments for safety upgrade projects, only the needed changes are captured. Everything else just that's good isn't documented. That works for your safety upgrade, but it doesn't really help you with your energy control program, so it may be worth asking for. Now, I call this step 2.5 because it really depends on if you're upgrading your safety or evaluating, uh, or if you're just evaluating existing safeguards. So here, I show two different Grand Tech methods for evaluating safeguards to make sure that they're sufficiently reducing the risk for the use of alternative methods. The one on the left evaluates all safeguards by specific criteria, and the one on the right tries to evaluate by the safeguarding method itself. 
This is a preference and it really depends on what works best for your program. The point is that there's a check to make sure that the existing solution or the proposed new solution is adequate. Step three is unique to the evaluation of lockout, tagout, and alternative methods. This step wouldn't normally be performed by any machine builder, integrator, or supplier as part of a risk reduction plan unless specifically asked for. Most risk assessments you get when you hire a company or buy a machine, like I showed earlier, are hazard-based and just make sure all the hazards are guarded. They don't typically address all the tasks and make sure that you know when you should be locking out or you don't. That falls on you, the employer, to figure that out. So have you ever considered asking for it? So this is just one example of what it may look like. And so what we have here on the left is some of the ways of defining what those words routine, repetitive, and, grand, and sorry, and integral mean. And we come up with grand tech solution. Then we have a decision matrix like you can see here on the right to determine where you should be locking out and where you can rely on the alternative measures. As you can see, most of the options are still lockout, but we do give options for using the alternative methods based off the Z244.1 process. So, as a continuation of the last slide, here's a snapshot of what it would look like for each individual task. So if you had 40 tasks, you would have this for 40 of them. You would have 40 times this. So I only show four tasks here, and you can see that in this case, three of them, we relied on the alternative method, and one of them, we relied on the lockout method. So this is a way of help identifying, like I said, if that solution that you're upgrading or you have is appropriate or not for the particular task. So, I love the last two steps together because they essentially serve a similar purpose for today's discussion. That's verification and validation. Basically, checks to make sure everything we just talked about was done right. In this example, I skipped the actual safety design and installation steps of upgrading and developing a safety solution because they're more for engineers. And we assume if you're doing an upgrade or buying a new machine that you have a whole project plan behind it, and that includes the design and commissioning. So verification is a step that checks that the safety design meets the requirements of the risk reduction plan. And that's typically done before anything ever gets built. Validation is a check that everything was installed correct and functions exactly the way it's supposed to, especially in the event of a failure. Most companies don't do proper verification validation as part of their safety systems because they're never asked to do it. Now, on the left, you can see two examples of verification checks, where in this case, in Grantech's case, we look over schematics, device configurations, mechanical drawings, and anything necessary to ensure the design is correct. On the right, we see example validation plan, where in this case, it's just one emergency stop, where we have an entire procedure to test that the emergency stop functions exactly as we wanted it to. Having this documentation helps ensure that the system in place is exactly what you expect it to be. Last thing you want is to have a safety device for a, used for alternative methods that doesn't really do what you expect it to do and you're just providing an illusion of safety. So now we have covered a lot today, but hopefully I was able to go over this new standard and give some insight as to industry best practices and an example where you can see a process at a corporate level and at a machine level to how to take advantage of this new standard. That was a general rule of thumb, this is a quote I've heard many times, the absence of an injury does not mean the presence of safety. And if you don't have a written documentation or any written documentation explaining how your machine is safe, then it's not safe. At the core of the Z244.1 standard is the user and the supplier of the machinery. And that interaction between the two, between the two groups, determines the success of the overall lockout system. Alternative measures are commonly overused in many workplaces as conveniences or excuses for not locking out. And in those cases, they often are poorly thought out and poorly resourced. Alternative methods done correctly demonstrate the necessary precautions that must be taken to assure that worker safety is well done through a combination of engineering controls and administrative controls. Now, Grand Tech can help you on your journey to becoming a world-class uh, player in safety. Whether you're starting from scratch or making incremental improvements, we can help. We provide thought leadership at a corporate level through facilitating the development of specifications and building out your programs, all the way down to the machine level where we conduct assessments, develop risk reduction plans, create safety requirement specifications, we do turnkey remediation, and even update safety design and engineering. We do site surveys and we develop procedures, checklists, templates, or any of the supporting information you need. So let us know if there are areas that we can help.